Is China more capitalist than the US? I know, it seems like an absurd question. We have all heard that China is super left wing, the great socialist empire. In fact, the only party that governs the country is the Communist Party, and make no doubt about it. If you ask any Chinese citizen, they will be absolutely convinced that they live in a system created by and for socialism. Even so, can you tell me the name of the most successful Chinese companies? I'm sure companies like Alibaba, the owner of AliExpress, which is a private company, will come to mind. Another, probably, is Tencent, the owner of video games such as League of Legends, which is also privately owned. And if you like fast fashion, then you may have thought of Sheen, which again is another privately held company. For such an apparently socialist country, the truth is that something does not add up. So much so that many analysts already consider China to be more capitalist than Uncle Sam right now. China does capitalism better than the US. The Harvard Business Review, in an interview with economist Wei Jian Shan, points out that China is one of the most market open economies in the world, and that it even receives more investment than the massive US economy. And here, let's be clear, all of this is strictly true. It is no longer that the best known companies in China are private, but also that Western companies such as Tesla, Volkswagen, and Apple have invested in and created large businesses in the Asian giant. So can we really say that China is socialist? According to this view, hardly. The visual economic community, as in everything in this life, there are always two sides to the same coin. True, many Chinese companies are private, but let's not kid ourselves, many others are state-owned. And if we search Google, a lot of sources will appear indicating something like that in China, 60% of the companies are precisely government-owned. We will see in a while whether this is true or not, but for now. Another thing that many of you have probably thought about when assessing whether or not China is a socialist country are its five-year plans. Because, you see, I'm sure you've all heard about Mao Zedong, the Chinese communist dictator who, in the 1950s, pushed for the the Great Leap Forward, a disastrous economic plan that starved tens of millions of people to death. We are talking about what was surely the greatest economic carnage in history. Well, the Great Leap Forward was a five-year plan. A five-year plan with which socialist countries meticulously determined the objective levels of production and economic development of a country. That is why it is said that socialism is a system of planned economy, because it is mapped out with these five-year plans. And do you know what? Yes, China still has five-year plans. China works to meet 14th five-year plan targets. Therefore, in theory, China would have a planned economy with a large proportion of state-owned enterprises. But then why do many analysts point out that it could be even more capitalist than the US? Well, I can already tell you that these five-year plans and state-owned enterprises are a bit of a myth. And yes, in many respects, China is much more capitalist than the US. That said, let's move on to Chinese capitalism. To know whether China is more or less capitalist than the US, first thing we have to determine is what capitalism is. And no, don't worry because we are not going to bother you with technical definitions. We have made a list of four elements that will help us to know if one country is more capitalist than another. The first of these is taxes and state spending. The lower they are, the more capitalism there will be. The second is regulatory interventionism. That is, that the state allows companies to do business freely and without hindrance. The third is free and neutral competition. In I deal capitalism. The government does not give privileges to certain companies to the detriment of others. It allows them all to compete with the same rules. And finally, we will talk about economic freedoms and legal certainty. Citizens must be able to set up businesses, enjoy private property, be able to enter into contracts with third parties without interference from the state, and there must be a legal framework to protect these rights. Well, to examine the Chinese case, let's start with the first element. When talking about taxes, perhaps the first one that comes to mind is income tax. And so the question is, who has the higher income tax, China or the US? To find out, we have calculated how much four different types of people would pay based on what they earn. First, a person on the poverty line who earns 60% of the median income. Then, a middle class person with an average income. An upper middle class person who earns twice the average income. And finally, a wealthy person with an income 10 times the average. Well, first of all, the income tax in China for middle and lower 
lower class people is 0%. That's right, they pay no income tax, whereas in the US, they would pay 12 to 17%. But China's upper middle class pays only 4%, and for the wealthiest people, the tax is only 20%. In the United States, it is practically double that. The differences are overwhelming. China is practically a capitalist paradise when it comes to getting paid. However, another tax that both workers and companies pay in their payrolls is social security contributions. And in which country are more social contributions paid? Well, this is where things are different. Contributions in China are 52% of gross salary, while in the United States, they are around 16%. If we take this into account, China pays a lot more taxes than Uncle Sam. But this is visual economic, and as we always say, the devil is in the details, as you will see. If we look at the breakdown of China's social contributions, the first item is the pension fund. One third of this pension fund is in a private fund. That is, it is money saved directly by the worker. It is not a tax or income that can be spent by the state. In the US, pension funds must be contracted separately, so it would be unfair to count it as a tax. Then, the second item of the Chinese social contributions is the housing fund. The housing fund is a kind of piggy bank that the worker can use for housing-related expenses, to pay rent, a mortgage, a renovation, the down payment of a house. It is not really a tax either because the worker has this money at his or her disposal. And if that person decides not to spend it, it is saved until he or she leaves their job, as if it were a kind of insurance against dismissal. Again, it is not money that is used or received by the state. China forces its workers to pay for health insurance. So, is this a tax? Well, hardly, since it is a direct service. After all, in the United States, people pay for insurance separately, but to consider it a tax would be unfair, since it is a direct service for the citizen who only receives it if he or she pays for it. So, if we subtract from the contributions everything that is not collected by the state, but our personal savings funds or health insurance allocations, and we calculate the actual percentage of taxes collected by the state, what we get is the following. Hiring costs in the US are almost double those in China. So there is no question here. China is much more capitalistic when it comes to hiring taxes. But be careful because this is not the end of the story. It is not only that taxes in China are low, but also that more than half of the country's employees work informally, without an employment contract, and without being registered. In other words, it is normal in China for a worker not to pay any tax, because most of them work under the table. And you may be wondering, does the government allow this? Well, not only does it allow it, it encourages it. In fact, the Chinese government itself hires people under the table. For what reason? The reason is that when China moved from pure socialism in order to open up to private private enterprises, many people left the rural areas for the cities. Suddenly, new jobs in the private sector started popping up in a big way, and organizing such a transition was not an easy thing to do. To make it easier to create a private market, the Chinese government simply decided to turn a blind eye to informal employment. What they wanted was to create jobs at full speed, regardless of whether they were formal or informal. It came to such a point that government administrations also participated in this labor arrangement. So basically, everything about workers in China is much more free and capitalistic than in the US. But what about the rest of the taxes? As you can see on the screen, they are not very different from the rest of the Western countries. You could say that they are in the low middle range. And with respect to total state spending, this is around 30%, a relatively low figure, and certainly significantly lower than that of the US. Now the question is no longer just how China spends, but how much? I don't know. I think we all agree that a left-wing country with socialist tendencies should spend a lot on social programs such as education and healthcare, right? Well, yes, but it turns out that China does just the opposite. It is one of the countries that invests the least in social spending. Only 10% of GDP, almost half that of Uncle Sam and the OECD countries. This is due to the fact that China's healthcare system, for instance, is one of the least guaranteed in the world. Basically, if you don't have insurance, you are completely underserved. In the United States, however, there are extensive programs such as Medic Aid and Medicare that cover healthcare services for people with fewer resources. So, visual economic community, the Chinese are undoubtedly much more capitalistic in tax matters than the North Americans. Now, beyond the fiscal issue, what about state-owned enterprises, five-year plans, and regulatory interventionism? Well, let's take a look. 
Yes, it is true, China still has five-year plans, as it had back in Mao Zedong's time. But stop, before you communists start throwing your victory party, I have to tell you something. The Chinese five-year plans are as communist as Mises, so not at all. You see, these five-year plans were used right from the very beginning to plan and build the Chinese economy from the ground up. They decided how much steel would be produced, in which areas factories would be set up, how much grain would be cultivated, and so on. But as time went by, and with the opening of international markets, these plans began to lose steam. For example, the five-year plan of the 1980s, marked in green, contained many productive and economic framework objectives. Yet, in the most recent five-year plans, which we see in red, most of the objectives are social. That is, they have to do with aspects such as the environment, public safety, or the management of the elderly. But that's not all. The objectives of the original five-year plans were mandatory and very specific. For example, to produce X tons of coal. But now, the objectives are not mandatory, and rather than objectives, they are forecasts, ideological goals, and general lines of government. And to be fair, this is not so unusual. You don't have to go to China to find such a plan. Many other Western countries also follow general political strategies, such as the 2030 Agenda, and we do not claim that they are socialist. In any case, another important issue in Chinese socialism is that of state-owned enterprises. As we have seen previously, many sources indicate that the government owns 60% of the country's companies. Is this true? Well, no. In reality, this figure comes from the fact that the state owns 60% of the value of the Chinese stock market. But we must bear in mind that 1. Not all companies are listed on the stock exchange. And 2. Stock market value does not equate to real production. Therefore, how can we know what percentage of the total business fabric is state-owned? Well, the question is difficult to answer. Official economic data are scarce, but the World Bank estimated that the percentage of China's GDP accounted for by the state's participation in enterprises is around 23%. Obviously, this is only an estimate. But there are other data that point in the same direction. For example, it is estimated that government-owned companies employ between 16 and 20% of the labor force, and according to the IMF, the percentage of industrial production in the hands of state-owned enterprises is barely 20%. Conclusion? At best, SOEs would account for 20 to 25% of the Chinese Chinese economy. And keep in mind, this is a high figure, certainly much higher than that of the United States. But for instance, 40% of Saudi GDP comes from the oil sector, which is virtually monopolized by Saudi Aramco. Or similarly, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund has gross annualized returns of around 20% of national GDP. And you don't hear anyone saying that Saudi Arabia and Norway are two communist countries, or socialist countries on the way to communism, or anything like that. So then, why do they say it about China? Well, perhaps the answer lies not in the how much, but in the how. These are the top five banks in China, all state-owned. And between them, they make up 50% of the entire Chinese banking market. And then we have to add another multitude of smaller banks that are also state-owned. China will certainly not control most of its economy, but it does control the most important sector of all, the financial sector. Whoever controls finance can decide which companies grow, which sectors are boosted with more and cheaper financing, who gets credit, and who does not. And this is especially worrying if the decision-maker has more political than economic criteria. For example, do you remember the Evergrande crash and the Chinese real estate bubble? It all started because the Chinese government, starting in 2008, decided to boost its domestic market, particularly the real estate market, in order to maintain its levels of economic growth. And how did they do that? Basically, by using the financial system to shower cheap credit on the sectors of their choice, starting in 2009. In this sense, the problem is not only the clear interventionalism, but also the fact that government banks lend money and favor companies that follow political criteria, especially state-owned companies. This is something empirically demonstrated that also means that not all companies play on a level playing field. In other words, it is a completely anti-capitalist factor. Some of you may think that if it is so problematic for the government to be controlling the banks, private banks should emerge to compete. In fact, that is something that has already happened, or rather, there was an attempt to make it happen. This was the case of Jack Ma and Alibaba, one of the largest private companies in China and owner of Alipay, a payment system massively widespread in the Asian nation. Alipay posed a threat to the government. It was a tool that could take away its financial monopoly. In fact, Ant Group, Alibaba's financial subsidiary, was on the verge of 
of going public with a stock offering that would have been the largest in the country's history. However, its IPO was cancelled by the government just before it was due to take place. For what reason? Jack Ma made a public statement criticizing China's government-controlled and anachronistic financial system. Big mistake. After that, the stock exchange plans were cancelled. Jack Ma disappeared for months and the state got away with it. And this brings us to perhaps the most important aspect of all. Jack Ma's case is just one example of the discretionary power the government has over the private sector, but it is not the only one. There's also the case of Hiroshi Nishiyama, one of the 18 Japanese businessmen arrested for alleged espionage. Frankly, we don't know whether Hiroshi is a spy or not. What we do know is that China passed a new espionage law that allows the government, with virtually no legal security whatsoever, to detain and criminalize businessmen who are not in line with its political objectives, under the guise of espionage. Likewise, China is not kind to politically dissident competition either. YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram are banned in the country due to political criteria. In the US, on the other hand, there is a framework of legal guarantees for companies, however much they may annoy the politicians of the day. An example of this is TikTok. The US Congress has been trying for years to ban this social media network for being Chinese. However, the US courts have stopped the politicians and defended TikTok's rights to continue with its business activity. Here, again, Uncle Sam is much more capitalistic than China. And it's not just about business. Personal economic freedom is also severely curtailed. If you were Chinese, you would be prohibited from buying Bitcoin. You could not join a labor union other than the government's single union. You could not exchange more than $50,000 from Yuan per year to take them out of China. In fact, not even Chinese citizens living in the countryside can legally move to cities like Shanghai. In short, within China, it would be very easy to export and invest. Few taxes would be paid. But in everything else, the presence of the state and its strong political interventionism hardly make China more capitalist than the US. But that's just our opinion. That said, now the questions are for you. Do you think China is more capitalist than the US? Do you think China is a socialist country? You can leave me your answers in the comments. If you like the video, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. See you soon.